And welcome to Wednesday evening Fireside Chat with Pastor Ed. I'm sitting here in front of the fireplace um, uh, on my uh, our remote setup for the Wednesday night service. And this should be our last one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesse, I see no picture on my screen. Hey, hey guys. Glory. All right. Okay, mine's delayed then. All right, guys. Um, um, I was trying to make sure we were up and running right, and my, my screen was not showing. All right, let's share, write post, post, and okay. All right, well, anyway, I'm, I'm black screened out here. I don't know what's going on. Praise the Lord. Uh, we are with you tonight in less than 20. Hallelujah. See? Okay. Well, guys, hallelujah. Cap, do you have it on yours? Sorry, we're, we're, I'm just trying to make sure we're out there, guys, and we're not just um, not out there and we think we are. Okay, my phone ain't working right. All right, praise the Lord. Lesson twenty. Well, anyway, praise God. Uh, everybody, stay tuned with us. Uh, the upcoming snowstorm for Friday night at uh, possibly three inches, and then the Arctic blast on Saturday. Um, we, we will be communicating any updates or changes um, to weekend events based on um, what actually happens and so forth. and um, But we will let you know. Praise the Lord. I'm uh, just like, you got to be kidding me. Hallelujah. Um, we, it is scheduled as a fifth Sunday celebratory move-in potluck after church meal. Hallelujah. And um, so just, uh, just stay tuned and we'll let you know if anything changes. Glory to God. Amen. All right, uh, E.W. Kenyon's The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption. Lesson 20 is redemption, is redemption. And um, as Kenyon states, that the very object, purpose of the incarnation um, was that man might be given the right to become a child of God. Um, John, the first chapter, the 12th verse. John chapter, wow. One verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Praise God. Um, Christ came that we might have eternal life and be the children of God. Uh, man can only receive eternal life after he had been legally redeemed from Satan's authority. In other words, the power of Satan over mankind had to be completely broken so that man could then choose to walk free from that um, through the through the power of Christ, through the power of the new birth, not only, but the power of his, uh, you know, um, the redemption had to be completed with him the choice to, to um, walk free from it. This... Um, the, the step after incarnation is redemption because that's been the whole incarnation has been pointed at. Remember the Old Testament kept pointing to the incarnation, the culmination um, of everything in the Old Testament was pointing to the incarnation so that man could be redeemed. Then we begin with the New Testament um, and the incarnation appears. How do you Jesus, God with us, God manifest in the flesh. Um, which is necessary for redemption. 
Hallelujah. Um, we will talk about now how the, the incarnate one legally redeemed man from the authority of Satan and made it possible for him to receive the nature of God. Man's redemption is legal. God did not just come in here and violate his word, violate spiritual law, and just say, no, nope, we're going to do it this way. Uh, God can do anything he wants to do. He could. Well, then why didn't he stop Adam and Eve in the garden? Okay? Now, it wasn't that he didn't want to. He had given Adam and Eve the right to make that choice. And they thought it was the wrong choice, but they had the right to make it. Um, and so God had to win or make the path back legally. And this all centers on a term that you don't hear um, in a lot of circles in Christianity. There's a, there's a lot of places that just don't talk about this term, but um, identification. And it's a twofold identification. It is the man's identification with Adam and his identification with Christ. The entire plan of redemption revolves around this twofold identification, first of Adam and then with Christ. Hallelujah. And so redemption takes place with those who are identified as in the lineage of Adam, which is all man, and then receives the new birth through identification with Christ. Hallelujah. Paul had a revelation. And you refer to it, the theological term you'll hear people say is the Pauline revelation, P-A-U-L-I-N-E, the Pauline revelation um, of the finished work of redemption and the present day ministry of Jesus. So Paul's revelation is about the finished work of redemption um, Christ redemption and his now ongoing high priestly ministry in heaven. And Paul speaks of this revelation that was given to him in Romans 16, 25 and 26. Paul refers to it as my gospel, the revelation of Jesus Christ, not from man, but from God. Galatians 1, 6 through 17, Paul tells us that he received this revelation it is a revelation that had been kept silent, but now has been made known. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 12, Paul reveals that his understanding of the mystery of Christ had not been known to other generations. And that was due, in fact, to the fact he had received it by revelation. Within this revelation that Paul had received, as the basic foundation was the revelation of man's identification with Adam and with Christ, when a child of God grasps clearly this twofold identification, the foundation has been laid for the renewing of his mind. Now, most people believe, or scholars believe, that Paul received this revelation when he was stoned and left for dead. And the, the, the reason is because Paul states, I knew a man above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, such a one was caught up into the third heaven and heard things unlawful to be uttered. Okay? So they believe in Paul was stoned and left for dead, and um, he actually did die, it was, but was raised up from the dead, went into heaven, and there he saw the new creation man had the revelation of the Pauline revelation, which took him the rest of his ministry, of his life, to unveil to us in the scriptures. Because it was, it was so overwhelming and so different than the law, than and understanding who man really is and what man really is, that it took a supernatural revelation to describe what takes place in a man when he is born again. Hallelujah. So before we study the revelation um, of identification, we need to un understand why it was necessary for a revelation of redemption to be given after Christ had risen and ascended to the Father. Because that revelation wasn't in place and wasn't in force until after Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, 
there's a reason, there's a necessity to Paul's revelation. Uh, in the very first lesson of this course, remember that we talked about two kinds of knowledge. Uh, the one that natural man sense knowledge. And um, if we, which obviously means sense them for your five physical senses. You gain your information through what you see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can touch. Sense knowledge. And then there's revelation knowledge. Granted by the Spirit of God into the human spirit um, and affecting the mind. Uh, this is called revelation knowledge. The Word of God is revelation. The incarnation, in the incarnation, the revelation of Christ that was given to man was given to him on the level of the senses of his physical body. Remember John said in John 1, 1, uh, 1 John 1, 1 and 2, that which we've heard, which we have seen, which our eyes, which we've beheld, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now, um, a couple of reasons that Paul, I mean, John wrote that one was to deal with Gnosticism which said Christ had not come in the flesh. It was only spiritual, that he really did not show up here physically. He did not die physically on the cross, and he wasn't physically raised from the dead. That was just Gnosticism. And Paul dealt with that. I'm sorry. John dealt with that in John, 1 John 1, 1 and 2. Um Man had seen with his physical eyes Christ and his deeds. The life of the Son of God, man saw lived before him. He lived out that life in front of people. He heard with his ears the word that he spoke. They could touch him in his hands. The knowledge that the uh, man possessed of Christ during his life on earth was gained purely by his physical senses. The physical revelation of Christ, however, was not enough or sufficient for man's faith in Christ as the Son of God or his being the redemption in him. Remember, um, in Matthew 16, 15 through 17, Peter makes his declaration that Christ was the Son of God. And then Christ makes a strange statement. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who was in heaven. That was when Peter had seen that which he had heard, which he had handled concerning the word of life, by means of the five physical senses, um, but he had not gained this knowledge that way. It had come as a special revelation from the Father. And of course, it only lasted for a season, um, for Peter had seen um, the sight of Christ dying on the cross, his physical knowledge took over. And, um, you know, even maybe touched his body as they took him down to uh, bury him in the tomb. Now remember, when... Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Some say that thou art Elias, some say that Jeremiah, others say one of the prophets raised from the dead. And Jesus said, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for thou art, um, you know, thou art called Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, uh, we dealt with this before we dealt, even this past Sunday. There are two different Greek words used here. Um, and there are those who pur purport that Peter's the first pope because of this scripture. They use this scripture. This, this is the very scripture they use because he said, thou art Peter, which is Petros in the Greek, which means a stone or a pebble. But the, Jesus once said, and upon this rock, Petra, boulder, I will build my church. It was not that Jesus was building his church on Peter as the first pope. That's just erroneous translation or interpretation. It was on, uh, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father in heaven which is, uh, uh, has given this unto thee. And I say unto thee, thou art a pebble, but upon, uh, you know, really butts inferred here, but upon this rock, this boulder, I will build my church. What boulder? It's the boulder of revelation, the Petra of revelation, not the Petros of Peter, who was an apostle of the Lamb, who was uh, instrumental in helping begin the church with his sermon on the day of Pentecost 
He was an integral part of the um, 12 apostles of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And, and probably counted as the foremost of the apostles in their group, the 11 after, you know, Judas killed himself. Um, but Jesus did not build the church on Peter. That's just wrong. You know, then we get to the infallacy you know, of, of, of the priesthood and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, getting all kinds of crazy teaching. The, rev the, the rock that the church is built on is the revelation by the Spirit of God that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So it's the rock of revelation. Supernatural revelation, not to your senses. Remember Jesus told Thomas, after he had said, except I see him and thrust my fingers and place it to the palm of his hands and thrust my hand into his side, I'll not believe. Jesus shows up a couple of days later, walks, through, walks into the room with the doors all being shut up, walks straight over to Thomas and says, um, Thomas, stretch forth thy hand, place thy finger into the palm of my hand, thrust thy hand into my side and be not faithless, but believing. And he cries out, my Lord and my God. And Jesus did not go, I commend you for believing. He said, he said uh, Thomas, because you've seen, you have believed. Blessed is he who hath not seen, yet believed. It was a rebuke. And I've heard a lot of sermons on oh, my Lord and my God, you know, and, and it can preach real good, but the message there is not that. It's, it's not that he, Jesus shows up and you start believing. He was rebuking Thomas, and Thomas even became known in church history uh, as Doubting Thomas. Now, Doubting Thomas got his act together, folks. He became a missionary to Africa and went into Africa, and church uh, history tells us that he, he went, and there was um, one tribe he, of, of African that he went to to preach the gospel to, and they worshiped. They'd run out in the river and throw the water up in the air, and then they worshiped the rainbow crystals that when the sun was coming, that, that, was, that was their God. They would worship that. And Thomas went there, and when they were doing that, commanded the water to stand still. It stood up in the air. He preached Jesus to them, and they got born again and came into the kingdom. Praise God. So he, went, he didn't stay doubting Thomas, thank God. But at that moment, he was still wanting revelation of his, uh, he did not want revelation knowledge. He wanted sense knowledge that Jesus was alive. But Jesus declared that blessed is the man who does not see yet believes. Jesus declared that it was the rock of revelation that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that the church would be built upon. Glory to God. And somebody say hallelujah. Amen. So, it came as a special revelation from the Father, and, and Peter let that slip when he saw Christ die on the cross. The disciples saw the death and resurrection of Christ in a different manner because the Pauline revelation, they didn't understand. They did not understand. And, um, you know, we, we've, you know, most word of faith, charismatic people, printed preachers at some point in time have preached on what happened from the cross to the throne. And, uh, we'll probably do that this year. And we, we do that, um, every couple of three years at least. And, um, because that is what takes place here. The disciples knew the meaning of the crucifixion, the cross, his burial, and his resurrection only through their senses. They saw him die. They saw him cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They saw him give up the ghost, and they saw him die. And then they went and hid. And um, they had seen him beaten. They seen the hands, the uh, nails, or spikes driven into his hands and his feet. They heard him declare that the father had forsaken him, him taken down, wrapped um, partially for burial, but it was, it was approaching the Sabbath, so they had to wait until the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, to come. Um, they had seen the stone rolled away, the empty grave clothes. They had heard 
um, and handled the resurrected body of Christ. They had seen him uh, alive physically. They even saw him ascend into heaven. That physical knowledge did not give them insight into the meaning of the significant spiritual significance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In the crucifixion, they saw his physical suffering. They knew nothing of the spiritual suffering that he did when he was spirit was made sin. Remember, he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. They knew not where Christ's spirit or was or what he was doing during that time, what happened from the cross to the throne. They didn't know anything about him conquering Satan in his resurrection. They didn't know anything about the ascension of Christ with his own blood before the Father. Remember when Jesus was, was uh, had been resurrected and they came to the tomb and uh, Mary thought she was talking to the gardener and he asked her what troubled her and she said they've taken our Lord's body and he said, Mary, and she, her eyes were open, and she said, Rabboni, and she fell down and, and, and grabbed a hold of him. And then the King James says, uh, touch me not. And I've heard, you know, I've heard sermons preached about that, you know, uh, he wasn't, he was too holy or whatever at that moment for her to touch him, et cetera. Et cetera. No, um, Pat Robinson did a, a teaching years ago on, on the Greek phraseology there on why the word there should, really should have been translated, clutch me not. Instead of not touch me, let, don't hold on to me. Because because Jesus, and that makes sense when you hear the next words. Clutch me not, for I've yet ascended, ascended to my father and to your father, and to my God and to your God. Okay? <clears throat> and that still didn't explain everything until the Pauline revelation. Which is why, by the way, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Because there are things in Hebrews that are a comp complement and completion to the Pauline revelation. Like he entered in once and for all, not with the blood of bulls and goats or sprinkling of ashes of a heifer, but with his own blood he entered in, obtaining an eternal redemption for us. See? That's not revealed in these events of dying on the cross, being buried in the tomb, being raised from the dead, walking with it for 40 days and then ascending into heaven. We have no idea. See, we don't know. So when Jesus, when they came out, they just had to come by as Jesus was coming out. And um, Mary falls down and grabs him and he says, clutch me not. I've not yet ascended. Okay. Why? Well, he wasn't done. What did he have to do? <clears throat> well, he had to go into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood. But that's not, that's not, they don't see that here. There is absolutely no revelation of that yet to the, to the disciples. That that's all this that took place. Paul has to write this later after being caught up into the third heaven and seeing these things and, and having a supernatural revelation of these things where he can write it out as doctrine in the church, not just the excitement of a, um, what's the, what, what's the word I want to say? Oh, I saw this happen, you know, but Paul writes it not just as a, as a witness of an event that they saw with their natural eyes. Paul comes on the backside later and writes what was going on in the realm of the spirit. This physical knowledge of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension gave them no insight in or to the, or spiritual significance into his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. Um, they didn't know anything about his ascension with his own blood, and they didn't know anything about the present day ministry of Jesus at the Father's right hand, where he ever lives to make intercession for us. So a revelation is needed. I said a revelation is needed. It was necessary that the Holy Spirit reveal the complete redemption that was wrought in the spirit of, into the Spirit of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and you would have to read verses 6 through 16, 
but uh, shows or speaks of this revelation, that wisdom that it's called. Verses 9 and 10 say this, things which our eyes saw not and ear heard not, unto us God revealed them through his spirit. Now, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is any into the heart of, the, of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And then it says this, but we have the spirit of Christ. The spirit is the revealer. The Holy Ghost is the revealer. And this revelation is needed and could, but although it needed, could not be given until after Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to guide us into all truth. Now we understand that there was a necessity of revelation of redemption. It had to be given supernaturally. Let's look at identification. The very heart in the uh, and centerpiece in the revelation of redemption. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Romans 5. We'll just read it. We'll read, we'll read this. Romans 12. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Wherefore, is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed unto all men, for all that have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over, the, over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What did Adam do? High treason. But it still reigned over them even though they had not committed high treason because they were sold in the bondage under Satan. Um, who had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, which is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, to also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and by the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so it is, a, it is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, Adam's offense, death reigned by one over all, much more they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judge, of one judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift that came, on all, came upon all men unto the justification of life. Now, let me stop here. Well, that means everybody say, as far as God counted it, when Jesus raised from the dead, all humanity was saved. Don't explode. Don't let your brain explode. We know this because in Revelation, it talks about whose name, whose service name was not blotted out of the book of life. God wrote everybody's name in there, but those who reject Christ, reject the, the plan of salvation, reject the revelation, have their name blotted out. God had already put it in there. That's a heavy Rebbe. And I can't imagine the torment of hell knowing your name was in the book and it was blotted out because you wouldn't receive. It wasn't you were trying to earn to get in. God had already put you in. All you had to do is receive it. Accept it. Everybody just say, wow. Say it backwards. And say it upside down. Thank you. Hallelujah. Um, so by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, so many be made righteous. Moreover, thank you, Janice, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, remember, Baba talks about how the law was added basically to show us that sin was sin. Okay? 
It was it was given so that there was no, there was no misunderstanding about what sin was. Uh, moreover, the law entered that, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace <coughs> did much more abound. That as sin had reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. This gives us the picture of identification. We are identified with Adam outside of Christ. But then we identify with Christ and we are released from our identification with Adam. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's why, remember Jesus said, except you be born again, and Nicodemus says, how in the world can I do that? Remember, he still sense knowledge ruled. Can I, crawl, can I return to my mother's womb and be born the second time? And uh, Jesus said, how is it that you're a teacher of Israel? In other words, it's hidden in the Old Testament. And you're a teacher. And you know not these things? The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou knowest not the, uh, knowest the sound thereof, and with the winds that cometh, the weather it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. I say you must be born of flesh, I mean, uh, of water and of the Spirit. That second birth is that, you see, we're born in, in, in natural birth in identification with Adam. Then in Christ, when you're born again, remember Jesus said you must be born again. Hallelujah. Um, and then we come to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, or 17, and it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What? The old thing is the identification with Adam and his sin, and his transgression, and his high treason against God. And we identify in Christ and our reconciliation to the Father. And now I'm going to just tell you, that's shouting grounds. And um, uh, we, we got doors, side doors on the building. There'll be people, you'll be able to run out the side door, run around the building, come back in. Okay? Just want you to know that. So if you got, if you get a Holy Ghost shout coming on, you just hit the side door and come back around. Hallelujah. That sounds like fun, don't it? Hallelujah. They say, oh, them Pentecostals have moved in over there. Glory to God. Amen. Genesis 3 describes this, you know, Adam sin is high treason. We waited 4,000 years of silence until Christ came. <coughs> Paul reveals that man is identified with Adam in his death in the natural realm. Romans 5, 12, therefore is one through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death passed unto all men. That death that entered Adam passed unto all men. But it wasn't just physical death. It was spiritual death. The nature of Satan. In verses 14 through 19, death had reigned over those who had not committed high treason. Um, although, they were just as spiritually dead and lost without God, even though they didn't commit the high treason. Verse 18, um, identification with Adam, the judgment came unto all men. Everyone had to suffer. Adam's judgment became the judgment of every man. In verse 19, though Adam or, his, uh, or because of his identification with him, all men were made sinners. Paul reveals that down through the ages and even unto the present day, sin has reigned in the realm of death where Satan is Lord, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Lest they should say, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, the light of the glorious gospel and believe. Hallelujah. Because of the fact that human race was identified with the first man, Adam, now, there are two sides to redemption, the legal and the vital. The legal is what God did for us in Christ. Hallelujah. Um, the vital is what God does in us in Christ. 
So there's a legal side and a vital side to the fall of man. The legal side is what Satan did to us in Adam, and the vital side is what Satan does in us when by nature we are the children of wrath. Vitally, we were not in the Garden of Eden, but legally, his death, his bondage, his judgment, and all that spiritual death made him became ours. Now that God has redeemed man from every result of Adam's treason through identification of the human race with his son, this is the message that this revelation is bringing us in Romans 5, 12 through 21. The lordship of Satan over the human, over humanity was due to the identification of humanity with Adam in his crime and high treason. It is legally possible for the works of Satan to be destroyed by the identification of the human race with the Son of God, the second Adam. Look at the steps whereby Jesus, the Son of God, and humanity became identified in the legal side of man's redemption. The first step was Christ had to identify with humanity. It took place in his incarnation, John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. And then Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then the children are partakers of flesh and blood, uh, are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also took upon himself the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. He also made himself in like manner and partook of the same. As we saw, as we saw in our last lesson on that identification, he walked as the first man should have walked, doing the will of the Father God. Remember, when Jesus came to the earth through the virgin birth, and we covered last week, Jesus is the incarnation. There's no immaculate conception, all that other junk. He came in supernaturally, born in the womb, came out, and he walked the earth. Satan had no power over Jesus. They take him out, try to throw him off a cliff, he just walked through him. So he go out on a boat and Satan tried to drown him, he walked on the water. People didn't have enough to eat, he multiplied food. Storms came, he said, peace be still. Hello? A legion of demons show up in a man, and he cast them into pigs. Have you come to torment us? They couldn't torment Jesus. He tormented them. Everywhere he went and everything he did was the way man was supposed to have lived. Be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Hello. God had given man authority over all the earth. Every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth. I love what Buddy Harrison used to say. He said, thank God we got authority over creeps. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. So you got authority over creeps. And um, man had that authority. And to, when he transgressed in the Garden of Eden and turned that over to Satan, no human, no spirit in a human body walked on the earth again <clears throat> like that until Jesus came. Because he was not born under the fallen nature of Satan in Adam. Remember, Adam's death was a physical and spiritual, actually spiritual then physical death. Remember Adam told Satan, uh, uh, God, uh, about the fruit of the tree? And Adam says, um, that God said not to touch, not to eat it or to touch it for in the day that we eat thereof, we shall surely, I think Eve may have said this, God and Adam go, and Satan goes, thou shalt not surely die. But the, really the word with the Greek, not the Greek, the Hebrew there says in the day that thou eatest thereof, dying, thou shalt die. <clears throat> dying, thou shalt die. What was that? They had to die spiritually in order to die physically. 
the life of God in their spirit had to be removed in order for the body to begin the decaying process to die. God had created the human body to never die. It was not until the fall uh, that that body became mortal, death doomed. At, at the point that God created Adam and Eve, man's body was neither mortal nor immortal. It was just designed to continue to live forever. It wasn't immortality, not death doomed. That wasn't even in the picture. But when Adam ate, and Eve ate and then gave her husband with her, and the eyes were open, they saw that they were naked. They died spiritually. And then it took 900 years for his body to die. So were thereabouts. Okay? Praise the Lord. And um, it's hard not to get into here and not kind of slip over to the authority of the believer. It just, it really is. Um, because they're so intertwined into this teaching right here. Uh, but glory to God, we're, we're not going to do it. Um, where was I? So Jesus walked as, uh, Anna, as man should have walked. Think about this. God had already told Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. There's already there a lesson that there is something to have authority over and subdue. Adam could have stopped Satan there, and he didn't. Why not? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us why. It does explain the three things that he that, that um, caused him to stumble: the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's pleasant to the eyes, was good to eat, and desired to make one wise. <clears throat> lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the, and the pride of life. The very things Jesus overcame in his ministry, in his earth walk. So, how this 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 identification is what there was not was not enough. He had not identified with himself with the nature of man. He identified with his flesh, but not with his nature. Christ had to partake of the nature that reigned in the spirit of man at his incarnation. He would have been spiritually dead during his ministry. In other words, if he, had become, if he was born into the earth and already identified with man's spiritual nature, he would have been spiritually dead and could not have redeemed us. He would have been spiritually dead. He could not have revealed him to man. Therefore, his identification with the spirit nature was during the crucifixion when the time had come to fulfill the purpose for which he had come into the earth. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, uh, in a d direct uh, or you know, literal translation says this, surely our diseases did he bear and our pains he carried. Uh, wherefore we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The um, chastisement of our welfare was upon him and with his stripes we were healed. All we have gone astray and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And this comes from the Jewish translation of the Old Testament. Okay? So this, when the Jews read their um, Torah? The law, okay. The whole thing is the Tanakh. Okay, thank you. Um, huh? Tanakh. Okay. Sound like some Star Wars name. The Tanakh. Uh, when they read, this is how they read it. They don't read it like King Jimmy. Okay? Um, they read it this way. The revelation that Paul received in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, hath knew, he who knew no sin was made sin. King James puts the words to be there. You, you, if you could pick up your Bible and look at it, they're italicized. Go back to the beginning of your Bible, read in the study notes or the um, explanation 
um, in the in your Bible that any word that you find in italicized means that that word is not in the original language added by the translators because they thought it might help in aiding in the flow or reading of that in English. Now, that mean, what's that mean? They put them in there. Now, they thought that would be helpful, but it doesn't mean it's, it's not what's there. So when we take that out, it simply says, for he who knew no sin was made sin, not to be sin. He was made sin for us, okay, for God. For he hath been made sin for us who know no sin, that we might be made, <clears throat> the righteousness of God in him. Glory to God. Um, he not only bore our sins, but the sin nature itself was laid upon him until he became all that spiritual death had made man. Why? Because if he's going to not only identify with us, he's going to identify with us to the degree he can now become the substitute. We see none of this in the Gospels um, in dying on the cross, which the high priest sent the sacrificial lamb to the cross. Remember, he was taken to the high priest. And he was sent to the cross. The high priest, that was the last official duty of the Levitical priesthood was sending Jesus to the cross. That priesthood ended then. For one arose after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. And now he's our high priest. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. He had to take the nature of sin. So in the mind of God, Christ, uh, it's not Christ who, hung, listen, Jesus, it wasn't Jesus on the cross. It was the human race on the cross. Each one of us could declare like Paul says in Galatians 2.20, uh, I was crucified with Christ. Now, I think the King James puts it in the present tense. Most other translations put it in a past tense. Okay? Um, let me look over here. I'm pretty sure King Jimmy says, um, uh, I am crucified with Christ. About any other translation you'll pick up, it says, I have been. Okay? Uh, here, uh, Kenyon states, I was. So I have been crucified with Christ. Never, what? When he was on the cross, I was on the cross. You were on the cross. Humanity was on the cross. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We could all declare, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, a lot of you probably read the NIV, and I know it says it in the NIV. Pretty sure, just about positive, it says it in the in in NIV. Um, and other, other modern translations will state, I have been. So he bore our nature. In the garden, we were not there, but vitally we were. Legally, I mean, we were not there vitally, we were there legally. We weren't physically in the garden with Adam, but we were legally there. Because we were in his loins. In the same manner, we were not on the cross vitally, physically on the cross with Jesus, but we were there legally. The identification of the human race with Christ was just as complete as was this identification with Adam. Now the identification of Christ with humanity was complete. The steps of redemption have begun. Glory. Y'all going to have to hang with me a little bit tonight. This was a longer one. Um, the first step, pay man's penalty. The judgment of man must first be satisfied before God can redeem us. It fell on Jesus. He was forsaken of God. Um, on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why? it starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then Jesus on the cross and, you know, New Testament says it is finished. Now the 22nd Psalm finishes with, um, 
he hath done this. I believe I believe even the King James says it that way. Let me look. Um, yes, the very last phrase is he hath done this. Literally, that says in Hebrew, it is finished. Now, what when Jesus said it, it is finished? What's he talking about? That you know the plan of no the plan of redemption was not complete. We know that why? Because Jesus told Mary not to clutch me. I haven't gone to my father and your father. See, that makes no sense. If you don't read all the Paul's revelation, you miss out on what's going on. Paul states, I haven't gone. And then Hebrews declares he entered in with his own blood to obtain the eternal redemption for us. So the plan of redemption was not complete when Jesus gave up the ghost and said, it is finished. Most scholars... <clears throat> believe that he actually quoted the entire 22nd Psalm on the cross. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And why? Because if you read the 22nd Psalm, he goes on and makes a faith confession about his resurrection. 25th verse says, My praise shall be of thee of the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Uh, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kingdoms of the nations shall worship before thee. Hallelujah. Um, I'm sorry. He said, verse 25, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Jesus begins confessing his actions after the resurrection. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, Isaiah 53, 8 says, by oppression, this is again an alternate translation, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who did reason? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Now, once again, we are you know so sense ruled that when we think about being cut off out of the land of the living, we're thinking physical death. When in actuality, he's referring to Christ becoming forsaken of the Father as the judgment of man's sin, not the sins. Those are the result of the nature. God dealt with the nature and judged the nature of sin that Jesus allowed to overtake him. Uh, he died under our judgment, and we died with him. He paid our penalty in hell when we are identified with him. Psalm 88 gives us the picture of a righteous man in hell. Um. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. My soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from my hand. Now, some people say, well, Jesus just went to the upper regions of uh, Guyana and to Abraham's bosom. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. That's not Abraham's bosom. The wrath lieth hard upon me, or thy wrath lieth hard upon me. And thou hast afflicted me with thy, all thy ways. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily unto thee. I have stretched out my hand unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall thy dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? And thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Um, but unto thee have I cried, O Lord. And in the morning shall my prayer be, shall prevent me. 
Lord, why castest off my soul and hidest thou my, thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die for my youth. While I suffer thy terrors, I am dis distracted. Thy fierce wrath go over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me like daily like water. Thou compassed me altogether. Lover and friend, thou hast put me far off and mine acquaintance into darkness. And I like the way the 89th Psalm starts out. I will sing of thy mercies of the Lord forever. In my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Hallelujah. Psalm 88 is a description of the suffering in hell. Lost my place, guys. I'm trying to find back exactly where I was in my notes. Okay. Da, 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 da. And it gives, this gives, uh, okay. Uh, the wrath of God lay hard upon him. He was one with us in identification. Uh, Acts 2, 24 through 8 shows us the suffering of Christ in the hell. It tells that his soul was not left in hell, but that God raised him up having loosed the pangs of death. The Greek word pangs means intense suffering, showing that when Christ was raised, his spirit was loose from the intense suffering that he bore as our substitute, or our sin substitute. Christ suffered until God could justify the human race. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it reveals that Christ was justified in spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16. Paul writing a pastoral epistle to his son Timothy. Verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Right here tells us Jesus was God. Justified in the spirit. In the spirit. His spirit. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Hallelujah. He, he, in identification, he became so utterly one with us that he himself needed to be justified when man's penalty was paid. Rotherham translation states that Christ was declared righteous in spirit. That's the first step. He took our sin. He became sin and paid the price. Second step in redemption, was that um, he who had been made sin be begotten of God. Hebrews 1, 5 says, speaking of the resurrection of Christ, he says, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now remember, in Hebrews chapter 1, and folks, if Jesus, how can, how can it be? I don't know. I don't know how Jesus can be the second person of the Godhead, God, and still die spiritually and be separated from the Father and be raised from the dead and be born again. I don't know. But he, had, God has to turn to the angels at this moment and say, let all the angels of God, when he begin, the Bible says, when, and again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. They wouldn't need to be told unless something so spiritually out of place and never seen before took place that they had to be told, worship him. He's God. And he said, and again, I say unto thee, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He's not talking about the beginning of creation. <clears throat> he, Jesus at this moment is referred to. Now, remember in the Gospels, Jesus is called the only begotten of the Father. After the resurrection, he's referred to as the first begotten from the dead. <clears throat> and it can't be physical death. He raised people from the dead in his ministry. There were people raised from the dead in the Old Testament. Come on now. 
It cannot be physical death when it refers to him as the first begotten from the dead. There were folks raised from the dead all through the Bible and many under the very ministry of Jesus. Hello? Prophets raise people from the dead. Um, Elisha's bones raise somebody from the dead. Elijah raised people from the dead. Jesus, one of the first things he does is raise Lazarus from the dead. Then he goes by a funeral and raises the, 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 the boy uh, and, and the briar from the dead. Hello? He gives the disciples a commission, <coughs> the seven, to go out and told them to raise the dead. It cannot. We have a serious theological reconciliation problem if with reference to Jesus being the first begotten of the dead, referring to physical, because then we got a lot of out of balance scriptures that don't line up. Unless we're talking about the first one begotten from spiritual death, because he was made sin for us who knew no sin, and he died, and we, the Father forsook him, as he says on the cross. How? I don't know. Great is the mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in his flesh, justified in spirit. I don't know how he pulled it off. But God got more, more uh, sense and, and understanding and, uh, than we have. See, there are people who think if that if they if we believe that, then somehow Jesus is not God. No. Only God could redeem man. There was no other way for man to be redeemed. God had to do it. And the only way to satisfy the claims of justice, somebody had to take the penalty from for, for the sin. And no man born of Adam could do that. Hebrews 1 5, this day have I begotten, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Acts 13 33 says that God had fulfilled the same unto our children, and that he raised up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, so the, the preaching in the Acts, even by supernatural revelation, that Psalms is referring to this event of Christ being raised from the dead. Jesus Christ, when man's penalty had been paid, had to be born of God and passed from death unto life, just as man, because he had been identified with our spiritual death. After Christ had been justified in spirit and born of God, he conquered Satan as a man. It is evident that Satan tried to hold Christ within his authority. Satan uh, did, not, uh, did hold Christ until God could declare him righteous. And at that point, the Bible says this, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. I think one literal translation says he hurled back principalities and powers. Remember Jesus said, uh, the Old Testament says, and they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. And then when the father said, thou art my son, to this day have I begotten thee. Uh, again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, that all angels of God worship him. Satan was just going, not going to let go. But the Bible says Jesus hurled them back and spoiled them. And made a show of them openly. What? Triumphing over them in it. Demonstrating the absolute liberating authority of being born of God. A, a born of God may has over Satan's power. Jesus declared in that moment that the power of Satan to hold man against his will was broken. And somebody shout, Hallelujah. Romans 6, 9 again in Rotherham, who was delivered up for our offenses, raised on account of the declaring us righteous. When we were declared righteous, 1 Timothy 3, 16 reveals he was made righteous. Then he was begotten of God and in the power of his deity, he met Satan and triumphed over him as a born again man. Does not remove his deity does not say that he's not God. He is the second person of the Godhead. Colossians 2.15, 
and having put off from himself the principalities and powers, remember that, hurled back, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He displayed them as his conquest. He was the first man to free himself from Satan's grasp and triumph over him. When he rose as a man, Satan's forces were put under his feet. Under my feet. Is under my feet. Now my victory is complete. Jesus spoiled principalities, made a show of them openly. He's under my feet. Oh, the devil's under my feet. Okay. Let's get these questions done real quick. Hallelujah. What was the object of the incarnation? And it was that man might be given the right to become the child of God. And let's go three passages of scripture, uh, giving Paul's revelation. Um, and you can go back and listen. Or you can, actually, these are actually listed in under Paul's revelation there. Uh, Romans 16, 25 and 26 Galatians 1, 6 through 17, and, and Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. Why was it necessary for a revelation to be given? Because man could only see Christ through the senses. They knew nothing of his ministry and um, or and, and um, of his ministry at the Father's right hand of his ascension. It was therefore required that he grant man supernatural revelation in order to reveal the complete redemptive work of Christ. And what does identification hold in redemption? It is the heart of the revelation of redemption. What became man's by his identification with Adam? Adam's death, Adam's bondage, Adam's judgment, and all that spiritual death had made him became ours. That's what happens to us in Adam. Five scriptures showing man's identification with Adam. And again, Genesis chapter 3, Romans 5, 12, 14 through 19, 18 and 19. And why did Christ identify himself only with man's humanity in the incarnation? He had partaken of man's nature at the incarnation. He would have died spiritually at the very beginning and would not have lived his life out where he could become sin. When Christ identified with that, when was Christ identified with our spiritual nature? <clears throat> and it was during the crucifixion. And why was it necessary for Christ to be made alive in spirit? Because he identified with us so that he himself needed justification when man's penalty was paid. <clears throat> and when did Christ conquer Satan as a man after he was justified in spirit and born of God? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am sorry we, we went way way over <coughs> the hour of uh, the hour of power and a quarter hallelujah amen did y'all enjoy that guys hallelujah don't forget um now like i said the um the forecast for friday has significantly changed from earlier this week and i don't know what's going to happen as we've seen in the past two storms they don't either um, but it does appear that we have um, possibly a, a winter storm coming in Friday night. Now showing one to three inches of snow. With flurries on Saturday morning or snow showers and a high of 33. And then a low Saturday night of 13. <coughs> Now, obviously, uh, all of our plans for the weekend can be could be a, a adjusted because of this storm. We just don't know. Okay, we don't know how bad it's going to be. We don't know if it's going to be like a dry a dry snow that that blows away and washes away. We don't know if there's going to be black ice all over the planet. We don't know. We just don't know what's going to happen. And this by midnight night, this could all change. And they say it's going to be eighty degrees. You just with. With the weather around here, you just don't know. I'm just giving you a heads up. Be watching for text messages or emails. Well, text messages. We got all the all in text messaging. Be watching for the text messages to see uh, if there's any adjustments or changes um, to the weekend. And um, 
because it's it's important that we communicate. Hallelujah. Time for our offering. If you need to uh, give, you can give through Cash App or PayPal. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the givers, the tithers. We thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them and that you do empty out and pour out upon them blessings that they do not have room enough to receive. We thank you that they walk in prosperity and blessing and everything they set their hand to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I, I will be greatly disappointed if we can't meet this weekend because of the weather. We miss y'all. It's been a month now, uh, a little over a month now, and we are, we are so look, we're so looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. Um, but, you know, again, um, weather and people driving and that kind of stuff, we don't, we, we, we want to be sensible too. So, um, if we have to be remote, we will be at the house and we'll do it remote from here. We're not going to, because we, like I said, we have no internet at the church, so we won't be able to go remote. We couldn't let, well, who can make it, make it. And then we go remote for everybody else. Um, this Sunday one uh, in the building would not be remote. So we just, you know, we will, we'll cross that bridge after Friday night. Okay. And we'll let you know, praise the Lord. But we do love you. We appreciate you. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. And we'll leave you with these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Hope uh, and, and our trust and our hope is we will see you Saturday and Sunday. Hallelujah. Be blessed. See you then. Bye.